Now, my father, who was uh, quite a character and had always loads of stories to tell, was using one of these hammers. He was hand raising a piece of silver with this smooth headed hammer and he caught the edge, made a mark, which normally you would, you would file out or you'd polish out and start again. But he thought, in this case, I might just repeat this, which he did, and out came this sort of texturing here. And he thought, well, this could be very, really interesting. And so he just developed it and decided that the easiest way of, of repeating it is not to keep on obviously using the edge of the hammer, but to carve in a section of this texture into the hammer head, which he's done here. And as you're hand raising a piece of silver, as you're hitting the metal, out comes this texture. Simon Benny holds three royal warrants as a gold and silversmith. In the 1970s, his father ran a firm employing 25 staff. But today, House of Benny is a modestly sized design business. His exquisite handmade objects in precious metals are renowned for their stunning enamel work. As well as crafting bespoke objects for the royal household, Simon creates beautiful individual pieces for private clients. Silversmith Alan Evans has worked with Simon and his father for nearly 60 years. The texturing that is the signature feature of Benny silverware is still known in the trade as Benny Bark. What I'm working on now is a commission for a client who'd like a pendant for his wife's 50th birthday party. So the, the very first thing is that they normally a phone call or a, a quick chat about roughly what they'd like. I then start here with doing some rough sketches, just getting ideas in my head. Also ideas of color. You have like 50 different colors of enamel. So I grew up in a house where we had a workshop attached to the house. And so I grew up literally going into the workshop with my father and bashing bowls around and plates and hand raising copper dishes and things like that. And not many kids have that opportunity. What's made here? Gerald Benny, the silversmith who designed the altar plate for Coventry Cathedral, specializes in formal and ceremonial work. As so much of his silver work is too costly for ordinary people to own, Gerald Benny has now turned his talent to designing cutlery in stainless steel as well as in silver. Dad was very technical. He was a designer in the true sense of the word. And I basically designed the same way. I make sort of prettier drawings rather than technical drawings. But the silver industry as a whole has gone through huge changes. All the big factories in the Midlands have all gone. And what is left of People like me, artist craftsmen who do special one-off commissions. It's very niche, it's not a huge, um, but you do make, hopefully make some very beautiful things. You'd never expect to find such a workshop as this inside a sleepy country house. One thing that hasn't changed since the days of Simon's father is the young silversmith filmed here in 1965. Alan Evans is still working with Simon Benny today. I must have been either 23 or 24. The thing with the ladle was purely the cameraman's idea. I would not normally do that. I started as an apprentice in 1953. I can remember the job I was making a spout for a coffee pot on the first day I started. Alan started work in Gerald Benny's London workshop at a time of real change in British society. Out of the workshop in Whitfield Place, you could look straight out onto the post office tower being built. It was the new age. The enthusiasm for a modern way of living had a significant effect on the industry in which Gerald was an important figure. Just drink in the elegance of this young artist's tableware. The days when middle-class families had their own silverware have gone but Gerald was a canny operator, 
and his cutlery and tableware designs were licensed and mass-produced in stainless steel. Nowadays, how many people want to have a silver tea set to clean? People probably want their new BMWs as a status symbol rather than silver. This house here is where I was brought up. I was born here in 66. My parents bought the house in 1962, I think, from memory. And of course, in the early 60s, you can buy old country houses like for very little money. They weren't rich by any means, and so they, they basically bought a wreck. Their bedroom was here. I mentioned that because I was born in this bedroom on New Year's Day during one of my parents' many parties, but um, Dad delivered me, which was uh, curious. And I then went back to the party afterwards, so Mum was up there with me on New Year's Day, party raging downstairs. And when I was a kid, sort of seven, eight years old, I started going into the workshop and bashing bits of metal around, which used to drive Alan crazy. I first saw Simon, he was a, a day old. And uh, as he grew up, when he, was at, he used to go off to school, but when he was at home, there was this period of time when we had a job to keep him out of the workshop because every time he came in, he couldn't leave anything alone. So he, he'd pick up a hammer and he'd say, now put that down, Simon. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's, <laughs> I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> After a consultation with his client, Simon brings his ideas for the pendant to Alan for appraisal. Okay, this is the idea about the pendant. The advantage of such a bespoke piece the is that the pendant will be a highly personalised item. Accents top and bottom. George's wife, Lucy, is on the court of the Mercers. In, in their crest is this Mercer's maiden. Well, I think uh, the best way to do this hinge is, is to instead of having it on the side, is to have it on the top. Yeah. With the design agreed, work can begin. Like so much else in the workshop, the 1953 milling lathe came from Gerald Benny's workshop at Beenham House and has been lovingly maintained by Alan ever since. The main body of the pendant will be made from two pieces of 18 karat gold. Of course, everything that comes off the scrap always goes back, but they remelt it, and uh, that will probably be the next lot that we buy. You never really know where the gold actually comes from, but whether it's from a mine or from Briggs Matt, we don't know. This is the front part of the pendant, turning this out to take the enamel. The racks of ancient silversmithing tools contain many items that are genuine museum pieces. Dad got them from some of the old workshops which were going bust in sort of Sheffield and Birmingham and they had thousands and thousands of tools just lying around. And you should just come pick them up and buy them. Just went up, filled the back of the boot, you know, full of all the tools, brought it back to Beenham. So these guys are, some of these guys are 100 years old. There's one particular tool here that I used when I was an apprentice. It's very rusty now because it hasn't been used for many years. But uh, it used to make chalice bases. This is uh, one of our simplest beakers. We call it a one-on-one beaker. They're normally textured, that kind of classic bark texture. The hammer marks, we use a, a flat, polished hammer instead of a carved hammer, which leaves all these hammer marks in. And then we do a light polish, which makes it nice and bright, but doesn't polish out all these hammer marks, which gives a quite a nice ripple effect. Like his father, Simon is amongst a very select group who have simultaneously held four royal warrants. Royal warrants are very significant to me, especially with new clients. It's kind of a seal of approval. The royal family, you obviously love your work and given you a royal warrant. So there must be a certain quality, a certain standard and a certain amount of trust, which if you can give that very early on in a relationship, 
it kind of makes it so much easier because they basically trust what you can do for them. It's very personal. Say if you're supplying cornflakes, while you're supplying cornflakes, there's no real direct relationship particularly. But with what I do, it is a very personal thing. There's very personal gifts you're making. From that point of view, it's, it's lovely because you do get a feel for how they operate the family. I did a blue bowl for the Queen. I didn't actually meet the Queen. Some key rings for Princess Diana. The 101 beaker starts as a flat circle of silver and is gradually raised by repeated hammering over different shaped formers. You could probably raise up the shape within a day and then, say, another two or three hours to smooth it out again. It's a state of mind, isn't it, really? If your mind wanders too much, then uh, you find that things can go wrong. It's a bit like driving, isn't it? If you're driving a car, you're not thinking, I must change gear now. A certain amount of automation takes over, but uh, you're still thinking about what you're doing. Otherwise, you run into the bloke in front. The back of the pendant, which is to be engraved with a picture of the client's daughter, is cut from a sheet of gold. The difficult is not breaking the blade. Right, that has got to be flattened off now, so when the two pieces come together, they will meet neatly. But the trouble is, when you enamel, because it's oval, sometimes it will alter the geometry of it slightly. This gold tubing I'll cut three pieces off, which make what we call the knuckles of the hinge. There it is, got it. Many years ago, I was doing a ring with, <laughs> with a, this valuable sapphire. It was quite a larger stone, and what happened was it had dropped down this hole at the back and ended up inside, and it took me about seven or eight hours to find it. These are the three components of the hinge of the pendant. Middle one is attached to the rear of the pendant and the outer two are attached to the front. The middle one has the loop on to take the chain like that. At this point, progress is interrupted by a vital stage in the manufacture of any item of gold or silver. Simon must take the pendant to be hallmarked. The name comes from the mark given at the SA office at the Goldsmiths Hall in the City of London. In order to qualify as 18 carat, it needs to contain 750 parts per thousand of pure gold. The gold content, which is the one we're primarily interested in, because that tells us whether it's up to standard or not. The hallmark contains Simon's own maker's mark, the crown for a gold item, the gold content, the leopard's head symbol of the London SA office, and a lowercase r for 2016. In order not to distort the shape of such a small item with a hammered stamp, the hallmark can be burnt onto the pendant with a laser.
the Goldsmiths Hall has regulated the trade in precious metals and looked after the interests of its members since its establishment in 1339. The Benny name is held in high esteem here. Simon's father, Gerald, brought about something of an Elizabethan renaissance in English silversmithing. And Simon is meeting one of his most ardent collectors. They've taken 25 years to put together. John is to curate an exhibition of work by both Simon and his father in Hong Kong next year. It will be their first joint show. There are 45 examples of Gerald Benny's boxes on the table, many of which Simon has never seen. This is a classic of the period, it's a yes. Scandinavian influenced, very clean lines, a very beautiful piece. Gerald began to seek an alternative to the prevailing Scandinavian look after an American woman visited his workshop in the early 1960s seeking English silverware. But Mr. Benny, this isn't modern English silver, it's Scandinavian. After that incident, he set about altering the very way that he worked. And this is in House Beautiful of June 1962. I am trying to design silver which is immediately recognisable as English. I think English silver should be rugged, solid and functional, but at the same time modern. Mm. One of Britain's best kept secrets is the quality of its craftsmanship and design with silver. Mm. And your father is instrumental in that. Gerald's boxes were mainly made as commemorative gifts. This one has been engraved with a prospect of the Ford Motor Company's Dagenham factory. The Hong Kong exhibition will include some of Gerald's pieces from the goldsmith's own collection. This chalice shows the influence of contemporary British sculptors like Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore. They also have a coffee pot from a set made for number 10 Downing Street. Well, in the 1960s, this was the time when Gerald really became well known as a designer silversmith, particularly of modern tableware. And here at Goldsmiths Hall, we use the 50 settings that we commissioned from him for cutlery every week at lunch. He was a very modest man. Here was someone who had four royal warrants, would just as an aside say, oh, by the way, I'm going to be staying at Balmoral next week, so you won't be able to get hold of me. But Gerald's significance extended beyond his own work. As principal of the Royal College of Art, he inspired future generations. He has been the major influence. No other country in the world is as good at modern silver design as we are. We have 66 living silversmiths who are all antiques of the future. Now bearing its hallmark, the next stage for the pendant is a visit to two relics of London's once flourishing silver industry, who are still making a living doing things by hand. The trade itself is completely dying. You know, we're dinosaurs, we're a dying industry. People want technology. So a new TV, new phone, this is coming for a refurb, it needs a little flick up. So that would be what you would call the outside done, but to do the inside, we have to make our own little tools. I worked for Jill for about 28 years. He was very, what I would have called, Edwardian. Always turned up in a nice big car with his chauffeur. I remember one occasion he sent me in two five light candlesticks, rang him up and said they're done. He sent his daughter that afternoon to Clifton. She turned up in a sports car. I said, you're not going to get them in there. She said, no, they'll be all right. I said, are you going back to work now? She said, yeah. At that time she was working at Beckham Palace for Princess Diane. So the car was quite safe being parked up with the boxes in it. On the other side of the workshop, the design for the engraving is finalised. So the plasticine goes onto the back of the paper. Uh, once you draw through with a point, this will leave a fine line of plasticine 
onto the surface of the metal, which you then can draw over with a fine scribing line. And from the fine scribing line, you can engrave the outline that you're eventually going to cut up to, to remove all the background of the metal. Steve grudgingly admits that there are machines that do engraving now, but the human touch still gives the best result. With an engraving tool, it's about catching the light. So you can do a cut that you turn it round and it'll look sort of positive or negative. Whereas the piece that's done on the machine or on the laser, for the most part, once it's in metal, looks flat. Yeah, you still need to be able to look at something. I think if I put a little flick over the top of her eye, it all looks slightly different, whereas the machine doesn't do that. The pendant now makes its final journey to London's jewellery quarter, to a basement in Hatton Garden, where the diamonds will be added. This is the enamel we're going to use on the pendant. Uh, it's um, an emerald green colour. Basically, it's a type of glass with metal oxides to colour it. The green, I believe, is uh, arsenic is used and barium, some usually nasty things like that. So we have to grind this. Now we're ready for applying it to the job. Gerald Benny's enthusiasm for enamelling began in Sloane Square when he saw a multicoloured display of towels in the window of Peter Jones and decided what his work needed was colour. Enamelling was something of a lost art since the demise of the Russian jeweller Karl Fabergé. Gerald made a trip to Zurich to the firm of Birch Karodi where he tracked down legendary enameler Berger Bergerson and persuaded him to come and stay at Beenham House. He was a very tall, slightly heavily built Norwegian. He had a great sense of humour, spoke very good English. He could even come out with English puns. Uh, he was a great linguist. He taught us what you really needed to know. You're learning all the time with enamelling. Bergerson had learned his art from emigre Russian jewellers who had worked in St. Petersburg, and Gerald was proud to be able to trace his enamelling DNA straight back to Fabergé himself. Simon has inherited his father's love for deep, lustrous colours in enamel. This goes on the stand. The material is the ceramic that they use on the space shuttle tiles. It's ideal for firing enamel on. It's not so bad on something like this, but if it's a beaker where you've got the enamel on the sides, you have to make sure that it's perfectly dry, otherwise it just drops off the moment you put it in the kiln. Several enamel items Alan made during his time working with Gerald are now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, but he doesn't let that sort of thing go to his head. I don't think I'm particularly proud, no, it's uh, pleasing, but uh, if you're exhibited in a museum, it tends to make you feel a bit older. <laughs> the sense of depth created by the combination of the glass and underlying textured gold becomes apparent as the pendant gently cools. Well, what we've got here is um, a motor with a, a felt mop. And uh, what we have to do is use a pumice and water to polish the enamel.
years ago. And it's just beautiful. It just really is beautiful. I go to London about twice a week to see clients and to uh, meet with my suppliers. And it's kind of a perfect combination of living here with the family, um, but working part of the week anyway in London. It's a lovely place to work. I can sit out in the garden, have my pencil and paper and just feel very calm. Let thoughts gather and do lots of sketching. It's quite nice to have that kind of calm environment to design in because sometimes if it's too frantic, two things, two things going on, it's quite difficult to get good thoughts in your head. But it's much easier out here. I'm very different from my father. Although I have carried on in the same vein, we are quite different. I'm not too worried about a dynasty. If one of the kids wants to follow on, that's fantastic. But if they don't, and are interested and passionate about something else which they love and hopefully are successful at, that will give me as much enjoyment as if they were part of Benny going forward. And when I die, I want my ashes up there. Scatter them right, that little tree at the end. Make sure the wind is going like that direction. Yes, it's, it's not too bad. It's, um, it's turned out reasonably well. I'm never really pleased with something when it's finished. You can always improve on anything, really. I'd like to be a perfectionist. My wife says I am. <laughs> what I love about this particular little pendant is that it's got all the elements which kind of show off some of the skills we have, and that is stone setting, enamelling, the green at the front, and then we've got the lovely red enamel at the back, hinge making and engraving. The guys who helped me with this have done an amazing job, and they're all experts in their field. The actual overall feel of it is pretty much as I wanted, so yeah, I'm very happy.